Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's town hall for small business owners in Cheltenham Township. I'm Jeff Cherico, and I am a member of the Township's Economic Development Task Force, which is a citizens committee designed to support business growth and business retention in Cheltenham Township. It was established by the Township Commissioners. So the task force's goal is to support business retention and growth. And as you all know, it's never been tougher to run a business anywhere than it is right now. So we want to thank all of you who have already invested in this township. And our hope is that this meeting and future ones we schedule will connect you with valuable information and resources to help you sustain your business and, if possible, allow it to grow as we move through the age of COVID-19. A few housekeeping items. First, we're going to keep attendees audio and video off. And we ask that if you have any questions, and we hope you do, that you write them into the chat box. And I will keep track of them and try to ask as many questions as we possibly can in the next hour. And before I pass this on to our moderator today, I want to point out that we hope to answer many of your questions. However, we realize that because of the fluid nature of the reopening plans in Pennsylvania, there may be specifics our experts can't address today. But I do want you to know that we will be compiling your questions and our goal is to get you answers to those questions. So if it doesn't happen during the town hall, our committee will follow up to help you get that information and then send it to you in an email. We also will use your questions to plan our next town hall. We have compiled and will send you shortly a list of links to resources that we anticipate you may find helpful. So now allow me to introduce the moderator of today's town hall and the chair of the Economic Development Task Force in Cheltenham Township, Dwight Lewis. Good afternoon, Dwight. Good afternoon, Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for participating. Um, we are faced with a new kind of open um, after the shutdown of COVID-19. Reopening the township will not be business as usual. There will be a lot of requirements and new norms, some of which will be discussed today. In fact, we have a panel of experts on various topics related to reopening small business. We are here today because small business is the heart of our township and we need you to help preserve and restore our economy. I will give a brief introduction of the panelists um, and then ask them to speak for hopefully no more than five minutes. Um, that will be followed with questions that have been submitted in advance. I will ask those, uh, I will repeat those questions and provide the answers from the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, we wanna bring clarity to the question, so I would hope that when I give the answers that uh, you'll be free, free to respond, but I would ask that don't, um, don't be conflicting, if you will, with what I'm presenting because it's from the state. However, we do wanna provide uh, clarification and we don't want confusion. So if you believe that there's something is not right, um, let's talk about it offline and we'll get the right answer to the people at large. Um, following that, we will open questioning to the group as a whole. Um, with that said, I will introduce the panel, but before I do, I do wanna thank, personally thank Gretchen, who did a lot of work, and I'm sure her plate is full, uh, but she did a lot of work to get a couple uh, key people on this panel, so thank you, Gretchen. I uh, didn't want that to go unnoticed. So we have with us uh, Terry McEwen uh, from NOAA Bank. He's the chief lending officer. Uh, he's having all kind of uh, technology problems working from home, but hopefully we will get through them um, in time for him to speak. We also have uh, Rob Goza uh, from the SBA. He is the lead economic development specialist uh, for Eastern Pennsylvania District Office, uh, which he joined in 2013. Uh, there's a lot to be said about Robert Goza based on what was presented, but I do want to acknowledge two things. Uh, that Robert uh, served as Chief of Public Affairs for the Southeast Louisiana 
Veterans Healthcare System in New Orleans, uh, where he was a captain in the United States Air Force and as a photographer in the United States Navy. So I wanted to mention that because I wanted to take a moment to thank uh, Robert for his service. Uh, we also have with us Elizabeth Zimmer Mall. Mall, my apologies, uh, from the Department of Labor. She's the Community Outreach Resource and Planning Specialist. Uh, hopefully, she'll be able to talk about wage and hour, license and inspection, and other things related to reopening. Uh, we have our own Fred Milbert, who is an insurance partner with Cornerstone Agency Services, uh, located throughout Philadelphia and in Morristown, New Jersey. And Fred is also a long time member of the Economic Development Task Force. And we wanna thank uh, Marty Tussman uh, for joining us. And uh, he's with Jenkintown Building Services. Uh, everyone knows about Jenkintown the Building Services and the red truck with the yellow writing. Did I get that right? Um, and I'll let uh, Marty talk more about uh, uh, what he does and what he's doing as businesses continue to open. Also on the call, we're happy to have um, Allison Elliott, who is the assistant uh, township manager for Sheltonham Township. Um, Allison will talk about what the township is doing related to trying to uh, control the spread of COVID and what the township is doing um, as it relates to small businesses reopening. And that may be limited to the guidance that they're getting from the state of Pennsylvania. I want to acknowledge, I believe three commissioners that are on the, uh, um, on the call who are strong supporters uh, of the township, but certainly strong supporters of the EDTF, uh, Commissioner Rappaport, Rappaport uh, uh, Mitch Sunfeld, and Matt. So thank you all for, for being with us. And before we get started, um, I would just ask, as I was telling the, some of the subcommittee earlier today, that after we got off our call last night, I made a big mistake and turned on CNN. And the first thing I heard was that we had over 100,000 folks that have died to COVID-19. So if you would join me just for a moment in silence for the over 100,000 folks that have died as a result of COVID-19. Thank you. Okay, so in the order that I just presented, um, I would ask the panelists to uh, talk about what they're doing related to um, uh, to COVID-19. Uh, we'll start with uh, Terry McEwen. Thank you, Dwight. Appreciate it. And I want to thank uh, Jeff and Debbie for inviting Noah Bank to participate in Cheltenham Township's Economic Development Task Force Summit. And this is probably a timely and worthwhile uh, endeavor for all of the business community to actually listen in and, and get some pointers on some of the programs and, and some of the activities that, are, that the government has put in place to really help them. And it's good that the SBA is on the line as well. But Noah Bank is a $400 million community bank. It actually has offices in Chellingham on uh, Old York Road. Uh, and so we are right in the middle of the community. Uh, we have been involved with the government PPP program right from the beginning. But I'll give you just a little bit of background on Noah. Its focus is on small and medium sized businesses. But due to this, this COVID 19, the focus really has gone from small to medium to a lot more small. Uh, a lot more small businesses were impacted and affected by COVID-19. Uh, and we had to put a lot more resources toward figuring out how to help. 
Uh, we had a number of conversations with our regulatory agencies, uh, the FDIC and the state of Pennsylvania, uh, and they have actually uh, laxed some of the regulations around lending to some of the smaller and medium-sized businesses so that more loans could be done during this pandemic period. And so loans that are hindered or are hurt during the pandemic do not, do not be classified by banks uh, if they were performing before the pandemic. Uh, so please make sure that as you talk to your bankers and your bank that, you're, that you stress the importance of any downturn in your business really coming as a result of COVID-19 and the pandemic that we're currently in, if that is in fact the case. Uh, during this pandemic, NOAA Bank uh, started doing PPP loans where, where the government put almost $2.3 trillion aside for businesses to participate in what is a loan slash uh, forgiveness uh, funding. Uh, and the, the way the funding works is you're allowed to apply. It's a two-page application. So it's a simple application process. Uh, there are no, there's no collateral associated with the loan. And it's, and, and it's only, it's, it's underwritten based on the business credit as it stands. Uh, nothing additional has to be done. There's no credit reports that have to be pulled. Uh, the government has laxed the requirements on this funding. So it's a two-page application. And, and it's very simple to complete. Uh, the two-page application basically takes your annual salaries, divides it by 12, and then multiplies it by 2.5. And so your salaries are wages, and you're able to get a loan for that amount of money. And that loan is supposed to carry you through eight weeks of business. Uh, and so the, the government was looking at making sure business could stay afloat for eight weeks and keep their employees engaged. And as long as you keep the same number of employees and have them at the year end, the loan is forgiven. And so that's how the loan actually works. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is not necessary to go into a lot more detail about what's going on with your business because every business is at a different stage in, I wanna say some challenge based on this COVID-19 and the pandemic. Uh, whatever your challenges are, you're still allowed to apply for the loan slash recoverable grant. Uh, and so if you've been impacted strongly, if you're in a central business and you still stayed open, you're still allowed to apply if you've been impacted by COVID-19. So please take that under advisement as you move your businesses forward. Uh, and as we slowly get back into the reopening, if there are issues, make sure you're out in front of your bank, that you're talking to your banker about what you believe or what you perceive your future needs to be. Uh, as a small business lender, we, we do specialize in that. And so we've actually had conversations with over 300 of our customers over the last few weeks. And a lot of those conversations are remotely, uh, which is a new challenge for a lot of us. Uh, but we're figuring out how to communicate either through Zoom or through conference calls. Uh, but we are figuring out how to communicate. And as long as we're communicating, as long as we're getting information in, and as long as we're able to assist and help, uh, and I think every bank right now is looking at ways in which it can address uh, its clientele, its customer base. Uh, and even from a, a, a perspective of you're not a customer of a small local bank, you're a customer of a large bank, and you are not able to get someone to answer questions or get you an application for the uh, uh, Paycheck Protection Plan, which is the PPP program, you can go to a small community bank that you're not a customer of, and they can still process your loan. So we've processed a number of loans for non-customers of NOAA Bank. And so every bank has, is allowed to process loans. Uh, NOAA Bank happens to be an SBA preferred lender, so it, it, it knows the SBA very well. It works closely with the SBA and it worked very closely during this process uh, to process over 260 uh, PPP loans and another 112 uh, deferred loans. So the government also allowed us to defer payments on loans for up to six months. And we've, we've, we've done a number of those as well. 
I'm not sure how the timing goes. Dwight, you know, I still on time or? Uh, no, you're, you're up. Okay. If, if there's any questions. Well, good information. Yeah, if there's any questions at any time, we're here to answer your questions and help you move forward. Dwight, would yeah. you like me to answer, uh, ask some of the questions that came in through chat? Uh, yeah, hold that to the end. Yeah, let's hold that. Let's get through All right. uh, the panelists introducing themselves. Sounds Is that okay? Good. Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, thanks, Terry. That was very good, very informative, but we'll be back to you. Thanks. Um, Robert Goza, where are you? I'm here. Thank you, sir. Thank you for everybody. joining us. Uh, we look forward so to what you have to say, uh, specifically related to uh, reopening uh, small business. Um, and we're talking when we talk about small business, we're talking about folks under uh, 500 employees, and more likely under five. Um, so hopefully you can uh, speak to some of the concerns of the uh, small business owners. Well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here virtually with you today. I apologize that you can't actually see me. Um, as I was explaining earlier uh, to the to the moderators, uh, my uh, my government issued laptop does not seem to want to work uh, and play well with others. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, thanks so much to the Cheltenham Township's Economic Development Task Force uh, for hosting this and inviting SBA to be part of the, uh, the conversation. Um, before we, just to kind of give a sense of framing around all of this to provide some points of reference for today's discussion, um, I'm the lead economic development specialist for the eastern 40 counties of Pennsylvania. Um, there's a team of about 10 people uh, in the district office who uh, are the, uh, the field office for uh, the Small Business Administration, which is the only agency whose sole mission is to uh, help small businesses start, grow, succeed, and in this particular instance, uh, to, to withstand the current situation. Um, SBA is obviously still open for business, although, although primarily both uh, virtually at this point. Um, but my agency recognizes small businesses are the drivers of everything in our economy, innovation, competitiveness, um, growth, and prosperity for the entire nation. Uh, we, and my agency is going to continue to do all that we can to support small business during this situation. Um, to that end, SBA is part of a combined federal response. The entire federal government is responding to this unprecedented national emergency as efficiently and effectively as possible. Um, we've been working closely with our counterparts at the state and local level, um, which I would heartily encourage anyone on this call to, to seek out the state and local folks. Obviously, if you're, if you're talking to folks uh, on, the, on the Economic Development Task Force here, you, you, you're, uh, you're part of the way there already, um, if not all the way locally. Um, and what all of this means for SBA's efforts is that our mission to empower small businesses to sustain and start and grow is probably it, it's it's never been more important probably in the in the nation of our hist in the history of our nation i i i honestly think we're living through times that no one saw coming um people keep saying the word unprecedented but so much that it doesn't really have much of an effect anymore um, but what that really means is we don't exactly know what the best answer to things is we don't necessarily have a completely ironed out process for things um, but we're doing everything that we can. Uh, during national disasters um, and economic hardship, SBA's regular program services and resources still are there for you. I'm going to go through the, the quick uh, list of those here in just a second, just to give you a quick overview. Um, but whether it's working with the folks at the state and local level to get uh, the disaster assistance, the, the disaster declaration to enable the economic injury disaster loan program to kick in, or whether it's working with the folks at the, uh, uh, here at the task force, SBA is part of what is all levels of government working to address this situation. Um, but we are implementing some of the largest programs my agency has ever undertaken. We're still rolling out policies and procedures, so much of this may still be subject to change. 
Um, it's a rapidly changing situation. I keep hearing the term that, you know, it's a fluid situation, um, which sounds to me like the river is running and we're staying afloat and, and navigating it as best as we can. Um, but Pennsylvania's businesses, small businesses in particular, um, have been hard hit by this. Um, and I, I certainly understand that. Uh, I've had some really tough conversations with folks uh, over the course of the last couple of months. Um, but and, and the number of those hard conversations, I've never been exposed to that many of them in, in rapid succession before in my life, I think. Um, but it's important to remember that you know, the, the, the best solution to all of this is to be delivered in your response, um, to, to figure out the best solution. Um, in terms of those programs that I was talking about, um, I'm going to give you a quick list of, of what's going on right now. So in addition to all of the things that SBA normally does, the CARES Act and the, uh, the Disaster Declaration for Small Businesses nationally added some powerful tools. Um, the first one uh, being the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. This is the only time that SBA makes direct loans to businesses. So we take the application, we process it, and we process payment through Department of Treasury, and it goes right to someone's bank. And the terms for these are, they are low interest, long-term economic injury disaster loans. They can go up to 12, I'm sorry, up to $2 million. The first payment is deferred for 12 months. The term, how long you have to pay it off is 30 years. Um, unfortunately, uh, currently the only businesses able to apply for, for the EIDL program at this point are agricultural businesses because they didn't get a chance early on. Um, and everyone who has applied uh, for the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program is being processed in a first come first served manner in the queue. Um, and they're, they're churning through those as fast as possible uh, in the uh, Office of Disaster Assistance. Part of that uh, program is a, is a uh, an, an economic injury disaster loan advance, which can be up to $10,000. It's based on number of employees, so $1,000 per employee, up to $10,000. Um, it's forgivable uh, when used for payroll and other operating expenses. Um, and that portion of it is forgiven pretty much as long as it's used for the purposes of the loan. Uh, also, it's important to remember you know, this is the latest in a series of things. Um, another disaster uh, uh, assistance issue just came up uh, in the last week with a, with a fairly large apartment complex fire. Uh, and those folks are eligible for disaster loans. There may be additional disaster loan possibilities um, in your area. So you should, you know, kind of stay mindful of that in case that becomes a possibility. Uh, but one thing to, to uh, to, to also keep in mind is that if you have an existing disaster loan, because unfortunately for some folks, this is not their first time through this process, um, it's, payments for those have been deferred through December 31st of 2020. And you don't need to apply for this. Businesses are, uh, all they would have to do is stop and restart any kind of pre-authorized debits that they've got set up for this. Um, hey, Rob. Small business Yes. Can you hear me? Um, yep. Can we come back to you? Um, how much more do you have? About two, 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 three things. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So um, the uh, the other thing uh, that's available is small business debt relief program. So that's through 7A lenders and 504 lenders and micro lenders. So if you have a current SBA loan. Lenders are deferring payments for six months on those as well. Um, you heard a little bit about the Paycheck Protection Program uh, loan program already. That's accessed through your bank or your lender. Um, and that's, you know, the eight weeks of payroll costs, including benefits. Uh, and you can use uh, up to 25% of that to pay interest on mortgages, rent, and utilities. Uh, the SBA Express Bridge Loan uh, is something you can use if you have an existing relationship with an SBA Express lender that could enable you to access the $25,000 of less paperwork, essentially. Um, and then, of course, our resource partners are always available to provide free counseling and low-cost training. So, um, you know, to help folks figure out a plan and a course of action 
So if you, and most people know our partners more so than us, um, even though, you know, we're kind of the umbrella that funds them. So if you've worked with SCORE, uh, a small business development center, or a women's business center, or a veterans business uh, uh, opportunity center, then you have worked with SBA, although we're kind of the silent partner funding that in the background. Um, and with that, uh, the only thing I would say is that I kind of get asked for general advice on this stuff. And the, the short, sweet answer to that is um, obviously stay calm and follow CDC and state guidelines, but definitely reach out to your bank to find out if they're participating in the PPP. Reach out to SBA's resource partners, get their assistance to form a plan for how to handle this stuff. And if you have been or expect to be, which I can't imagine anybody isn't currently financially impacted, you should be proactive. Contact your bank, your lender, your suppliers. Determine what steps you can take to mitigate those impacts. Um, none of us can predict the future, but we're we're getting it done as best we can. And my and and I hope uh, I hope every I hope it's going as well as can be for for everybody on the call. Thanks, Rob. You're going to hang in with us for a little while longer. Definitely. Okay. Great. Elizabeth Zimmer Ma, I just love saying that name. Elizabeth Zimmer Ma. It's better than Dwight Pedro Lewis. Um, thanks for joining us. Can you talk to us about uh, Family's First Coronavirus Response? And I'm sure you have other things to talk about, but specifically that uh, and how it relates to reopening small businesses in the township. Again, we're talking about businesses with five or less employees gotcha. versus 500. Thank you. Gotcha. Um, so big thank you, first of all, to Cheltenham Township for hosting us. Um, so I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator at the Wage and Hour Division for the Federal U.S. Department of Labor. Um, and our goal right now is just basically to get the word out about this act that passed. Um, typically, we're the agency that enforces like the minimum wage, overtime, other requirements like that. But now we get to enforce this FFCRA law, um, which was passed uh, and went into effect on April 1st. Um, the FFCRA is the new federal law that requires employers to provide employees with paid sick leave and expanded family medical leave. Um, and it, it went into effect April 1st and it ends on December 31st. The leave under this law is paid for through a refundable tax credit, a reimbursable tax credit. So employers, it's a way for employers to be able to provide paid leave to their employees who need to take it and then get reimbursed by the federal government for it. Um, we don't have tons of time, so I'm just gonna hit on the main provisions of this law. It is a pretty complicated piece of legislation. Um, we have a great FAQ on our website if you wanna like read a lot of that. It's like 90 something questions long. But uh, I'm just going to hit on the main provisions, and then I'm going to talk about the small business exemption to it. It is a very limited exemption, but it does exist. So, um, so the two parts of the FFCRA is the two weeks of paid sick leave um, under the EPSLA. So the first two weeks of it are paid sick leave, um, and that's at 100% of the employee's regular rate. And then the second uh, big chunk of it is 10 weeks for paid family leave. And that's for people whose kids are out of school or their case of childcare is closed. Um, and so it's a, it's a 12 week max. So the reasons, the reason that someone needs to take leave is gonna dictate how much leave they can take. Um, the six main reasons are that they are subject to a quarantine, a federal, state, or local quarantine um, or isolation order because of COVID. They have been advised by their healthcare provider to quarantine. They are experiencing COVID symptoms themselves and they're seeking a medical diagnosis. Um, they're caring for an individual who has one of those things. They, you know, the person is sick. Um, and then the big one, number five, is that they're caring for a child whose school or place of care is closed or their regular child care provider is unavailable related to COVID-19. So for the first few reasons, the federal, state, local quarantine, the healthcare provider, and the COVID symptoms, that's going to be paid two weeks at 100% of the employee's regular rate of pay. And then for the fifth reason, because the school or place of care is closed, they could be paid for 12 weeks total. So, you know, the first two weeks um, under the EPSLA, and then the, the last 10 weeks under the expanded family medical leave. 
So somebody who has uh, a child that's out of school can get up to a max of, of 12 weeks of paid leave under this law. Um, there's two very big exemptions from this um, that are completely exempt. Like these two categories of jobs are totally exempt from this law. That's healthcare providers. Anyone who works for a doctor's office, hospital, nursing home, retirement, home health care, any kind of health care provider is 100% exempt from this law. And then anyone who's an emergency responder, if they're EMS, paramedics, correctional, anything that's considered an emergency responder, um, that's, they're also going to be exempt. Then there is also a small business exemption, and it is a limited exemption. Um, it is applied on an employee-by-employee -employee basis, um, and it applies to um, when a small business has less than 50 employees, 50, and the reason that the employee is taking leave is that they're taking care of a child that's out of school or out of daycare. If the, if the person has, the reason they want to take leave is because they have COVID or because they're sick or whatever, um, or one of, any of the other reasons, then there is a small business exemption. The small business exemption only applies for um, uh, when the reason for the leave is that the uh, employee's child is out of school. Um, and then the third uh, part of that, so it has to be 50 employees, the reason the employee's taking leave is the child's out of school, and then also, that the requirements of the FFCRA will jeopardize the business viability of the business. Um, basically, you know, it's kind of a long definition of that, but that um, it, it could, the absence of that employee would risk the financial health of the business. Uh, then if all of those things are met, then the employee does not have to provide the leave under this act. They're eligible for the small business exemption. Um, so again, it's a limited exemption, but it does exist. So if you have, maybe you have five employees and you've got one that they need to take leave for their kid. And then you have one that has COVID, you have to give the two weeks of paid sick leave to the person, you know, that has COVID. For the person that has the kid out of school, you need to evaluate if that person being absent would jeopardize the health of your business. So, um, you need you need to um, basically look at it on an employee by employee basis to see if this law applies to you, and then once you've given the leave, um, you know this is a, uh, contact um, the IRS if you want to see like what the requirements are to send to the IRS. But it is refundable; it's paid through through a refundable tax credit, so you can get um, credit for that. Um, one little thing, there is a poster requirement under this act. The poster is free. It's available on our website. Uh, I've seen some things where uh, some companies are trying to charge people like $15, $20 for this poster. Don't do that. It's free. Um, if you want, I can send out a link to the poster. Um, and then, you know, if you go onto our website and you look at, um, you know, if you literally just Google wage and hour division on the front page of our the wage and hour division website, the big thing for COVID, and it has all of the resources, fact sheets for employers. The FAQ is probably the most useful resource that we have because it gets updated. It's the first thing that wage and hour updates is the FAQ. Like before all the other forms and stuff, they update the FAQ weekly and we're up to 90 questions now so every little possible issue is on there um, and then you can just give our our office a call if you have any other questions uh, we have people on every day 8 to 4 30 you know they're ready to take your questions so excellent thank you elizabeth i would ask all the panelists if you have any resources any links related to what you shared with us today if you could get those to jeff jericho i would greatly appreciate it Thank you. Uh, Fred, you're up. Uh, you don't need an introduction, so take it away. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Fred Milbert. Um, I'm a 40 year resident of Cheltenham and I've been on the EDTF for 40 years. a lot of time. <laughs> um, I'm an insurance agent. I'm a, a partner in an insurance agency called Cornerstone Agency Services. Uh, I have offices in three locations in Pennsylvania, one in South Jersey. I also currently insure quite a few businesses in Cheltenham and also a lot of families. So I wanted to discuss uh, two things that have been asked me over the last since this COVID came about, uh, and probably a lot of it may be familiar to you, but I just need to go over that with you. One is obviously the questions that most of the small businesses have asked about business income coverage. 
uh, when their business is closed or they've had to slow down, why aren't we getting coverage? And the simple answer is there is no coverage. Um, you need a direct physical damage to your facility and it has to be covered by a, a covered loss. Um, in this case, the virus is not considered that. And in fact, there is a specific exclusion for viruses in practically all your policies. Uh, then the question has always been raised, uh, well, the government has said I had to shut down. Why isn't there a civil authority exempt, uh, involvement? Again, you still needed a covered loss to have the civil authorities uh, close you. So, and a virus, again, is not part of that whole element. Now, you're hearing a lot of, uh, of lawyers saying, well, file the claim, which I've advised certain of my clients, go ahead and file the claim. Uh, it will probably be denied and it will be going through the courts for the next 10 years. Legislatures are looking to create new laws to retroactively change that. Um, that will probably be in the court another 10 years. So if you wanna go ahead, you can talk to your own agents and discuss if it makes sense for you to file a claim. Don't expect anything for a long time uh, on this. Um, and again, all the other programs that are out there is where you should avail yourself of that. The second part where is you can really perhaps look in saving some money is under workman's comp. Most, you're required on the state of Pennsylvania if you have your employees to have workman's compensation coverage. I've advised a lot of my clients to go back to their carriers and reduce their estimated payrolls. Um, and practically all the carriers are doing that. Uh, that can save you a substantial amount of monies. And the, so the second case where a lot of people aren't aware of, if you have a, um, a manufacturing facility um, and you've sent people home, you're still paying them and they're doing tele, uh, telemarketing, not telemarketing, teleworking, you can change their classification from the higher rate to a lower rate. Most people aren't aware of that and there's substantial savings that can occur from that. Um, another question is raised is what happens if my employee, is he covered if he, if he uh, is a result of the COVID? Now the question will be, did he gain it at your workplace? And that will be a question that will be uh, adjudicated by the Workmen's Compensation Board. Um, it is, you are, the employees are covered. And then the question is, if you have a claim, will that affect your rate going forward? The state is probably, from what I've seen reading, will not charge you for that additional claim that could be involved in one of your employees having a COVID uh, claim from that point. Um, the third thing is, um, the question is raising some of the, the businesses. What happens if a customer sues me because they think they were uh, infected by the COVID? Mm -hmm. Again, they would have to prove that and you are would be defended by your uh, insurance policy. And again, each policy is slightly different. If you have one of the major carriers with one of the more broad coverages, you shouldn't have an issue re regarding that. And if you have any questions, we can uh, you know, email me. I will send links. Uh, there are many links at the state level and in some of the uh, industries that would be very helpful to uh, ask that. Plus, always ask your agent who has the most knowledgeable information going out there. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. Um, next up is Marty Tussman uh, from Jenkintown Building Services. Um, they've been around since 1933 and is one of the largest window cleaning companies in the country. With that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Marty. Thank you very much. Uh, and I appreciate everybody's effort in putting this program together today. Uh, we've all attended a lot of programs and there's just so much to be consumed. And my dear friend, Fred, from whom I always learn a lot, just picked up a couple of points that we'll be following up as well. So um, I will be addressing a couple of issues related to facility management, facility preparation, some issues and concerns regarding, regarding COVID cleaning, and some of the concerns and ways in which we've had to manage our business and uh, maintain while we've been an essential business, there's been very much of a moving target in terms of the ways in which we operate and our understandings of so much regarding this virus. Uh, one of the things I'll speak to first is some of the protocol procedures regarding COVID cleaning. 
there really has been a lot of uh, debate and change of this over time, how long it lasts on service surfaces, uh, whether it's able to be acquired by surfaces, what cleaning protocol is required, whether drinking bleach is effective or not. Um, and um, the uh, ultraviolet light has certainly been something discussed as well. So I will speak to what we've been doing and we um, learned quickly, we operate a lot in the hospital and the healthcare environment. So we partner there uh, very well with a company who has had protocol in place for disinfecting and treating and protecting uh, equipment over years. So we've really joined with them in some of the cleaning protocol. We've called it a three-step or a four-step process. Basically, it's a disinfection process of all surfaces that's very hands-on and that's literally high touch and high hands-on areas in your facility. And that would be cleaning all desks, door frames, doorknobs, bathrooms, kitchen areas, countertops, computers, um, uh, keyboards, et cetera, et cetera. We have been doing this one as a first time process going through cleaning facilities, but then at many of our sites, especially at construction sites, where there's a lot of tradesmen in and out, we've been maintaining staff there, cleaning those high touch areas on a regular basis. Um, and that's a simple disinfection, disinfectant products. There's debate about which are more effective than others, and I'll be glad to take any questions offline through my email and uh, also help people in sourcing products, if you will, or any specific questions. But one is the treatment, the cleaning, the regular cleaning of high touch surfaces, especially as you have people coming back to work. You wanna be looking at what your work environment looks like and looking at how you're gonna be managing that. And everybody is facing those dilemmas. Am I coming back? When am I coming back? How many people are coming back? Uh, there's rotations of one third staff coming back how do I handle conference rooms? All these issues are ones that I'm sure many of us have been addressing and many of us will continue to and understand what our needs are. Um, my wife who also operates in Jenkins has just decided to stay out of the office until September 14th with her entire staff and evaluate what return to work will look like. But certainly as you return to your work, your responsibility is to maintain that clean work site to be disinfecting areas regularly. We've also provided electrostatic cleaning, which is a disinfection process, and also an electrostatic uh, bioprotection, which has a residual antimicrobial. Uh, there's a lot of debate as to whether the effectiveness of ultraviolet is there or not, and that's yet to be understood. And um, you, you, if you read anything online, you'll hear opposing opinions. Um, there's a lot of, as people are considering coming back to work, there is, uh, there are hand stations with sanitizers. We're providing them. We're helping connect people to resources for them. But uh, signage at your site, requesting or requiring, uh, I believe Pennsylvania just came out with ruling that you can, uh, at least New York did, I, and I understand Pennsylvania as well, you can ask, you can not serve somebody who's coming to your site that's not wearing a mask. I know that's law in New York, and I believe in some states, some states of course are resisting. I don't know if I lost sight there for a minute. There you go. You're back, Marty. All right. There you go. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, of course, uh, many sites are providing masks for visitors that may be visiting in, in person and um, it's a decision to be made. There's a lot of variety of them. We had sourced 5,000 masks earlier on at $7 a mask because that's all we could get. Now the availability of masks is much more reasonable. Again, we can help hook people up with sources uh, for supply. Um, and uh, each person basically has their requirements, distance marking for anybody visiting your site. And all the, uh, the CDC website is very abundant with uh, information about how to prepare your work site, OSHA guidelines for how to manage your staff. We um, specifically have our routines that I can speak to as well. Uh, a PSO, a new acronym we're all learning, a pandemic safety officer is required at all our job sites. We later learned that we didn't need one for our company, but we needed one at every job site we were working. They need to go through a training certification and carry that certification. 
Uh, so again, for every business, you will under you need to understand the requirements related to you. We have a temperature check every morning of employees coming to work. We have a checkbox in which they need to read and review that nobody there around has uh, showed the various symptoms and signs that, and they need to confirm that they're in good health. And of course, Fred or lawyers can discuss what the HIPAA, you know, variances are in, in this are. There's certainly the availability, availability of information that may not have been available before. You're allowed to ask those questions and address those answers. And again, that's an area that you need to understand well. Uh, we, of course, are providing masks to our employees. We're trying to address distancing. We're cleaning vehicles out. We're maintaining protocol when we're on a scaffold that's uh, six or nine feet apart on Liberty One or Comcast Tower. We need to be understanding what we're doing to mitigate safety. Um, protocol for our clients. We're asking clients questions, a series of questions. We have a residential cleaning div division as well, window cleaning. So we are actually asking clients as well before we show up to do business. So Marty, basically, I want it, this good stuff. Uh, I apologize. Um, um, did you want to finish uh, a sentence or two? No, in terms of just one brief point, in terms of modif modifying and looking at your workspace, there are certainly uh, what we're seeing now is a new business of sneeze guards and workstation dividers. We've gone to open desks. We've gone to open cubicles. There are retrofits of, of um, dividers that uh, can go into place. So everybody needs to analyze their specific needs of their facility and um, understand that either through CDC, through your various trade organizations relative to your business, we can certainly help guide you in the right direction as well. Thank you. So we're gonna do a time check. Uh, I'm sure everyone knows it's 3.50. This was scheduled for an hour. Uh, I have to apologize for not cutting people off after five minutes, but uh, all the panelists made sacrifices to come here. The participants are here to get information and the panelists have given them some good information, too much to cut off. So we're at 3.50. I'm going to ask uh, if folks could hang in with us for another 15 minutes after four o'clock. Um, we'll wrap it up with Allison. We'll address uh, very quickly the questions that were submitted in advance. Uh, Jeff has a number of questions for the panelists in the chat box. Um, and we can certainly take some in the chat box. Um, we'll try to answer as many as we can. What do, what do you have to say, Jeff? And Dwight, if you don't mind me saying, if the panelists can take a look at the questions, you feel free to answer them in the chat box for the benefit of everybody. You don't necessarily have to do it on Zoom. Um, and then when Allison is done, we're going to quickly race through these questions so we can get answers to them. And, um, and so if, if panelists can prepare their answers in quick, concise uh, answers, that would be perfect. Okay. With that said, thank you. Please hang in there with us. Good stuff, and it's only going to get better. Uh, Allison, the Assistant Township Manager, thank you for being with us. Take it away. I, I have to. There we go. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the township's uh, perspective on opening for business. Um, this is, a, as everyone has said, a very um, changeable um, and unprecedented, unprecedented time. So we're trying to understand the guidance. We are ourselves not creating guidance for reopening. Uh, so we are following uh, guidance from the county, the state, and the federal government uh, with, reopening, with respect to reopening. So um, we're doing the best we can to kind of filter through that information and put it on our website and get the information out to everybody as much as possible. So um, please check back uh, periodically to, to our website. We have a page that is dedicated uh, specifically to business resources for COVID-19. Um, and I think there's some, definitely some information that we will be adding uh, following today's uh, town hall meeting. Uh, we also have specific information generally related to COVID-19 also on our, on our website, and we're trying to push information out through, through Facebook. Um, 
the township itself is, is working um, pretty hard to just continue to provide essential services. Um, but this group, uh, the Economic Development Task Force, um, is, is our, as a citizen committee, is very important to this response. So um, you as business owners and operators, if you have questions or concerns or would like the township to address anything that's within our purview to help you out, um, I encourage you to reach out to the EDTF um, through their meetings. Um, we are continuing to have our meetings um, through, through Zoom, um, which is, uh, has been a, a real lifesaver for us as far as continuing to operate business as, sure, as I'm sure most of the businesses across the country and the world are, are experiencing as well. So um, they meet on the third Tuesday of every month at seven o'clock PM. Wow. Um, and you're welcome to send me an email if you have any questions. Uh, we'll review your questions, your concerns, um, and if it's something within our power, we will send it to, to staff and, and to the Board of Commissioners to see what kind of policies we can, can, can achieve to help you out. Um, so that's really all I have is specifically helping you out as far as um, keeping ourselves open. We've, we've been struggling with this as well. We've been doing, we're working on our own yellow phase reopening plan. Um, we will probably continue to operate um, with our staff at reduced levels. We've been splitting our staff, half work at, from home, half comes into the office, um, and just trying to spread everyone out, disinfecting as much as, like what Marty has said, wearing masks. Um, and when we do allow the public back into the building, I'm sure it will be at limited occupancy um, and spacing people out to, to make sure that we can, can keep everyone safe and healthy. Um, and it'll just be kind of a limited phasing of everything. Okay, thank you, uh, Allison. Uh, the first question, uh, need to know guidelines for retail brick and mortar stores. Uh, brick and mortar store guidelines for reopening and yellow phase. In-person retail is allowable in the yellow phase, but curbside pickup and delivery services are still preferred. Uh, indoor shopping malls may not be open during yellow phase. Retailers at indoor shopping malls with their own exterior entrances, as well as healthcare and pharmacy tenants, may be open for business and must follow the business and building safety guidelines. So I'm going to send out a number of resources from the state, and that's one of them, um, the uh, business and safety guidelines. Um, we will also send out the answer to these questions. Uh, number two, what is the path to reopening small businesses in our community? Um, we would ask that uh, you look at the reopening plan the governor has implemented and the state is um, uh, using uh, today. Uh, strikes an appropriate balance between public health and considerations of giving getting our communities back to work. In addition, the federal government has allocated nearly $4 billion to Pennsylvania to help mitigate economic issues that have arisen from the COVID response. Um, I will forward you the link associated with that as well. Uh, can newborn photography take place if I wear a mask and, oh, in a client's home? Take place if I wear a mask and stay six feet from clients, the answer is yes. Um, I am most interested in recommendations for what we should do within our office to make it as safe as possible for our receptionists, agents, and our clients. Businesses reopening for in-person operations must follow the business and building safety guidelines. We will provide that link, as well as CDC and DOH guidelines. We will provide those links as well on social distancing and cleaning. Um, so they are encouraging folks to uh, that are considering opening to go to the CDC website. So we'll provide those links. Uh, I applied for the phase two Mako Strong grant the day it opened. When can I expect to hear something? The redevelopment authority has been reaching out to grant awardees via email as grant awards have been announced. Thus far, 2.9 million of the 5 million available in round two has been awarded. The remaining grant awards will be announced in the coming days. 
The current list of grant awardees uh, can be found on the website. We will provide that list as well. Jeff? Uh, yep, Dwight, thank you very much. So we have this question. I'm gonna unmute um, Terry and, and Rob, perhaps the two of you can answer this. Is there still money available for the PPP loan? If so, it should be advertised for the companies that didn't apply the first time. I guess that's more of a comment than a question. Um, I will uh, unmute uh, Terry and Rob and uh, feel free to address that. Uh, is this, uh, are these loans advertised for companies that didn't apply the first time? Uh, sure, so the PPP loan program still has funds available. If the lender you normally do business with isn't a participating lender, you can search for a lender at the website uh, that I added in the comments section. I, I, it's basically sba.gov slash paycheck protection slash fine. Great. We also have another question. If a PPP loan grant has been received, the eight weeks will be up soon. Will there be additional monies available going forward? Currently, there aren't additional monies available if you've already received uh, a PPP loan and there's not additional funds available if you've received an EIDL loan in those particular programs. Um, and honestly, for that to happen, it would probably require legislation from Congress or possibly policy from Department of Treasury to, to make additional, I mean, but here's the thing, I would not, I, you know, like I would never say never to that because everything that's happened so far has been so far beyond anything I would have expected that literally anything is, is kind of on the table. Um, I have seen a lot of this stuff change over time the, you know, which, which makes some people nervous because it feels like the rules are being changed on them as things go. But the one thing that I have noticed about those changes is that they are almost always entirely in favor of the business owner. So the things that do change tend to be a widening of, of things and a, a, uh, a, a, you know, safe harbors being created and things like that. We have another question. If you have more than uh, one business, can you apply for more than one PPP loan? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can apply. Each business can apply for a loan. And if I can respond to the first question, as of last Saturday, 523, there was still $138 billion left in the fund that could be utilized. And the second question, uh, the, the, the House actually did put a new bill, a you know, new $3 tri trillion bill that it sent over to, to the Senate last week. Uh, the Senate has not reviewed it. I uh, thought the bill was done on arrival because of some of the the ass that were in the bill, but they may rewrite that bill and it may, it may make its way through the Senate at some point. Thank you, Terry. Terry and Rob, stay, stay, stay here. I applied for PPP through an online lender and still have not heard from them. Can I apply with NOAA Bank as well? If you apply at NOAA Bank and, and, an, and an authorization number has been issued by the SBA, we're not, we can't process it. So mm -hmm. the key is if that lender that they applied with has already received an authorization number. Uh, the SBA is only going to accept one authorization number uh, per, per borrower. All right. So let me um, bring in uh, Elizabeth here. Uh, Elizabeth, if you uh, could answer this question uh, from Rachel. It says, if a small business with less than 50 employees has an employee taking vacation and we want them to be quarantined for 14 days after, do we have to pay them? uh that's kind of it's it first of all depend on the type of business if it's if it would be normally a qualifying business um if the person is subject to a federal state or local quarantine order then yes they would still they would be that's one of the eligible reasons for ffcra leave but if they just took a vacation to like i don't know like the poker or somewhere that's not you know if you travel from there back to here or if they just had a staycation or something like that where they're not subject to a quarantine order, then it's that would be what we would probably consider a mandatory leave of absence and then you would not have to pay them. But it depends on whether or not, like if they went somewhere, you know, overseas or something and came back and then they're, you know, the government's requiring them to quarantine, then they would, you know, you would have to pay them because they have an FFCRA qualifying reason. Um, there may be unemployment issues with that too. I'm not unemployment, but, they might be eligible for unemployment if it's if they're um, taking leave for that reason. And I just want to clarify that is for businesses with less than fifty employees. Yeah, so businesses with less less than fifty employees, the only the only reason for the small business exemption is if their child is out of school. 
That's the only way you can get that exemption. So all those other reasons, the person has COVID, whatever other reason it is, there is no small business exemption for that. They still have to provide the leave if that's the, why they're taking leave. Thank you, Elizabeth, so much. That was, that, that was very helpful. All right, we have another question from Marty uh, about the separation areas for food service bars or retail where transactions bring people in close proximity. Do you have any thoughts on, uh, oh, sorry, Marty, I, the wrong person. Let me try to unmute you. <laughs> Do you have, uh, can you speak to that issue, Marty, regarding separation of areas for food service bars and retail? Um, how can people perhaps source the materials necessary or, or work to be able to achieve that, that separation? There's a number of providers, uh, suppliers of uh, the, the variety of sourcing that's needed. Uh, we have glass and plexiglass relationships of people that provide space dividers, uh, sneeze guards, cubicle station uh, dividers as well. Um, and I think that every business needs to analyze that. We're starting to see in restaurants, uh, of course, all of us online are seeing these bubbles that drop down that might divide uh, eating spaces. So I think everybody needs to evaluate what, what their particular restaurant situation is. I think the CDC is probably going to give you the best resource of information. I can certainly hook people up and I'm glad to have my email out there to connect people with various suppliers, but I think it's really on an individual basis. And I think it's uh, certainly separating spacing in restaurants. There's talk of 30%, one third roughly of the amount of, uh, of table space, but I don't know that, uh, that we're there yet in this region. And I think all of that requires serious analysis. There's a lot of concern, of course, about what's your break even um, in, for a business in terms of uh, what your clientele needs to be to support operations. So. It's new territory for all of us and um, seek guidance through CDC or your trade organization. Again, we're involved in many and they may be helpful. And uh, if it's a matter of connecting with suppliers, we'll be glad to do that. Thank you very much, Marty. We do have a question. What category would dance studios be in? Schools, gyms, or yoga? Allison, um, is that something that you would want to address? Sure, I can address that. Uh, this is uh, one that we kind of uh, spent a lot of time reviewing the information on uh, of late, especially once we start going into this yellow phase. Um, we've been, there's this graphic that we found online, uh, I believe it is on our website, um, which is the COVID-19 reopening phases for what's available, able to operate in red, yellow, and green phases. Um, and we've seen some more detailed guidance, but it is a little bit contradictory. Um, so what we've been seeing is that generally gym type um, programs cannot reopen, um, especially if they're enclosed in indoor recreation type facilities. Um, that doesn't, we haven't really seen any arguments against having these types of programs outside where people can space themselves out. Um, but as far as schools, I believe there are um, guidelines for, from the CDC um, that do enable them to open um, as far, also um, daycare facilities, summer camps, um, and things like that can open in the yellow phase. But again, the CDC does have some pretty stringent guidelines uh, for reopening under those phases. And I uh, do have a final question. I think we're just about wrapped up after this question. Allison, this is for you. Does a business need to submit a safety plan to the township or to anyone, I guess, for that matter, as they prepare to reopen a physical location? Good question. Uh, not to the township, no, but uh, as far as a general business, but we, we have required our own vendors to provide us with uh, safety plans before they start work for us. So you may find that if you have, um, you know, people that you are contracting out to, you might need to provide a safety plan to them. Great. All right. I think that's all our questions, Dwight. Um, thank you. Uh, excellent. Does anyone have any other questions that didn't make it to the chat box? Anyone? Yes, that would be me. Waving my hands. Oh, Lord, have door. mercy. <laughs> uh, mute him, please. <laughs> Go ahead, Commissioner. Kill, kill, kill the video. I know. <laughs> Go ahead, Commissioner um, Bransky. I, I had two. The first is probably the easier one. 
um, even though you know Dwight and I use the, the same beauty salon, um, I, I've been asked, it could, <laughs> could a hairdresser come to someone's home hmm. and give them a haircut? Hmm, good question. I, I have a wife and she drives a mean powered wheelchair and I don't want her bang is getting in front of her face. Thank you, Brad. I don't know that we have someone, uh, well, let me ask you, Allison, before I assume um, to, to, know the, to, to know the answer to this, do you have a, a thought on this? I don't um, have any thoughts on that. Um, you know, I've seen um, guidance that really, you know, has said that even whether you're in the, a person's home or not, um, that just because you're within that six foot space, that they don't recommend it, whether but um, what about out on a, what about on, on a patio or a deck where you're an outside environment? Same situation. Yeah, yeah. I would I would defer to the CDC or you know state uh, guidance. I'll take that, that question to the state later today and have an answer for you tomorrow. Okay. And and, and add and add dog groomers to that list, Dwight. When you do not that, not that you need a barber though. I said you and I use the same guy. Okay. All right. And last last quick question. Um, I got a request even from the um, head of the uh, Community Development Corporation asking me about blocking off a street like uh, down at the train station so that the restaurants there could have outdoor dinner mm. and, and seating. And I see Dwight, Dwight's thinking, hmm, that's interesting. So I don't think anybody has an answer for that. But we're getting closer and closer you know, to yellow as it is. And it would be nice if we could block off that stretch of high school or whatever there and have an outdoor dinner or something to that effect and let the restaurants serve some Awesome. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that. Uh, no, we, I think, don't. I, we don't have answers for both those, uh, Commissioner. Yeah. So we're well, gonna... I can provide a little bit of a response to that. Um, yeah. it, Commissioner, is that something they're looking at to do permanently or like for one event? Uh, it could be uh, several of them, depending on how this quarantine situation works out and cool. you know, what, what stages we sit in. Quite frankly, I expect there's going to be an uptick given the rush to get outside, but um, it would be nice if there was no, a way not. To, be, to be able to have Monday, some mute Mitch, would you please? Um, there, there would be nice if there was some way to be able to allow these restaurants, because a, a couple of years ago, we had a big outdoor dinner there where they set up tables end to end that covered almost the length of the street. Yeah. All right, Commissioner, I'm going to cut you off because we have we are 10 minutes over time and mm -hmm. we value everyone's time here. And we really appreciate the people who have uh, come to support uh, this town hall to gain some information. We especially thank our panelists who have been uh, very generous with their time uh, and uh, can't thank you enough for making the time to help our community, our, our, our small businesses in Cheltenham Township through this very difficult time. Dwight, do you have a, last, a few last words? Uh, yes, one, I want to applaud the panelists. Why don't we applaud the panelists? It was extraordinary. Um, I would, if you, if we don't have your email address, please make sure that we have it. There's going to be a lot of follow up, um, um, and we want to try to address them within the next few days. So if you can make sure we have your address, that would be perfect. Um, the. Um, All right. The commissioners, it's, it's 412. Did any commissioner want to take a minute to say anything uh, other than Brad? Uh, Mitch or Matt, I'm not sure if uh, Commissioner Rappaport is still with us. But I'm still here. All right. I'd like to just say thanks to everybody. Okay. Yeah, li thanks likewise. Th thank you to all the participants, the panelists, and thanks to the EDTF. Thank you. Nice job, Dwight and Jeff. Thank you and everybody. Thanks for participating. <laughs> Awesome, everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining and uh, stay tuned. We're planning another town hall on different topics. So uh, we're here to help uh, as many of you as we possibly can. So don't uh, feel free to reach out to us at cheltenhamedtf at gmail.com. Excellent. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.